Good afternoon. It has been such a pleasure to have you all join us throughout the week for our first virtual NLCC. And I hope that you are excited about all the presentations that are upcoming. Once again, I am Dr. Sandra Barnes, Vice President of the Colin Natchez Campus. We're happy to welcome Clifton L. Talbert back to the NLCC. Mr. Talbert is a longtime supporter of the conference and has delivered presentations multiple times since it began in 1990. Talbert has written 14 books in total, produced a major motion picture, and served as a consultant on several documentaries, Jews in the Delta and the Emmy award-winning Boomtown, An American Journey, which details the birth of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was a founding member of the DeNovo Bank, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Today, Talbert, a graduate of the Southwest Graduate School of Banking at Southern Methodist University, serves as the director of Central Bank of Oklahoma. Talbert, a member of Phi, Phi Beta Kappa, graduated valedictorian of his high school class. He now serves as a trustee for the University of Tulsa and is on the board of reference at Oral Roberts University. In 2017, Ambassador Barbara Stevenson, president of the American Foreign Service Association, presented Talbert with the 2017 Citizen Diplomat Award, the highest honor given by Global Ties US. Talbert has been inducted into the Enlisted Airmen Hall of Fame. He is also a recipient of the 27th NAACP Image Award for Literature. He is a trustee for the Tulsa Library Trust, the Oklahoma Foundation for Academic Excellence, and the Tulsa Historical Society, and he serves on the Eudora Wealthy Advisory Board, the Ann Catherine Sickle Cell Fund, and the Indian Nation Council of Boy Scouts. Talbert lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and shares his life with his wife, Barbara. They have one son, Marshall Danzy Talbert, a film and fashion entrepreneur in Los Angeles, California. Today, he will be speaking on remembering Wall Street for the 100th anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Massacre. Please remember, you can ask questions anytime using the comment section during the presentation. Mr. Talbert. Thank you. We're headed in the right direction technology-wise now. Okay, I think we're just about to get there. Thank you. And for those of you who are watching, I really appreciate your presence, though I can't see you. But hopefully we'll be able to hold a conversation about the past, about the present, and about the future. But first and foremost, at this particular juncture, I'd like to give a special thanks to Carolyn Van Smith, who was my source of an invitation to Natchez many years ago, my very, very first trip, and one that my wife and I have continued to make over the years. So I wanted to say thank you for that invitation. And I'm very appreciative to Emily Williams for the opportunity to speak with you today about a subject that has become very dear to me, Tulsa's Black Wall Street, its birth, how it happened, what happened, and what it means for tomorrow. Well, one of the things I wanna say, and I, I feel that everyone probably adheres to this, that history is indeed a great teacher. However, one of the issues that we face is our ability to go to class. History teaches incredible lessons, but if we're not in class and those chairs are empty, then we are missing some of the great lessons of life. Today, as we talk about Tulsa's Black Wall Street, you'll be in class. We'll take you back in time in history, but at the same time, provide information that will help you and myself to continually understand the human journey and the interactions that we have with and among each other, because at the end of the day, we all matter. 246 years, those are the numbers I want you to really remember, because for 246 years, starting in 1619 to 1865, Africans and those who descended from the Africans who were enslaved, they were part of the servitude and slavery system of our country. And for 246 years, these men and women were the back laborers of the cotton industry, the tobacco industry, and the rice industry. 
They were not necessarily brought to our country to know how to read or write or to be partners in the shaping of this great society. But they were there making their names known and filling in in places that perhaps had not been the start of their lives, but became part of their lives. So for 246 years, this was their world, slavery and servitude, cotton, rice, and tobacco. And when you think of it from that perspective, you begin to have some idea what happened in 1865 and how did Black Wall Street come about when the history that we're dealing with is 1619 to 1865. First, let me just read a little introductory statement to you. And because it reminds me and gives us all an opportunity to put history and this story in its proper perspective. History is a great teacher, but we must attend class. When we allow the lessons of history to become part of our thinking process, our present reality and future possibilities become undergirded with truth. When we move forward guided by truth, we leave clear paths and much needed light for the generations who follow. And for me, that's the most important thing that a human can do is to leave light for those who will follow so that their lives will be in a better position than ours and the stories that they tell will be different than the ones that many of us know today. History, a great teacher. So how did Black Wall Street come to be? That is the question that I'm asked from around the country, from universities, from business leaders. How did this come to be in 1921? Uh, only not quite 35, maybe 35 or 36 years or so in this time frame that slavery was over. So how do you get an economic engine that has captured the imagination of people around the country and in some instances around the world. How did Black Wall Street come to be? That is part of our conversation today. And I will share with you the information that I have gained over the years of research and interviewing survivors of the 1921 race massacre. There are several things to consider. Obviously, 1619, the bringing of the enslaved Africans to America. But 1803 also played a role as well. That's the Louisiana Purchase, because it is the Louisiana Purchase that provided the territory from which many of these Africans would now find themselves in the latter part of the early part of the 20th century. And then of course, you have the infamous Trail of Tears, 1832, uh, Andrew Jackson with the Removal Act in place, and from not only from, the, from Tennessee and from Alabama and the Carolinas, but also from the state of Mississippi as well. The Choctaw nations were among those who would be removed from their home states to the Western part of the United States. And oftentimes what people do not know is that there were a number around the number of 5,000 enslaved Africans who were also on the Trail of Tears who would find themselves walking from Mississippi, from Alabama, from South Carolina, from North Carolina as well, to what was then called Indian Territory. And then 1865, you had the end of the Civil War. And the end of the Civil War brought about two very important historical events. One being in 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation for those enslaved in the slaveholding states that had resigned from the Union to form the Confederacy. But it was the 13th Amendment in 1865 that freed the remaining of the enslaved people. Now they have pretty close to slightly over 4 million people who were once enslaved are now free. So what happened to these people? What do they do? Who do they become? And that's why the 246 years of servitude and slavery is so important because for 246 years in the slaveholding states, it was illegal for those enslaved to know how to read or write or anything that would move them up the economic ladder. They were strictly the backbone for the work that had to be done in those particular states. Now that is over, but I worked for, our company did I should say, for about five years with the state of California. Uh, working in the prison system. And when a person has been incarcerated 
for five to 10 years, they usually, for the most part, almost lose consciousness of the world they left behind. And oftentimes when they are released from prison within that time frame, many of them are so adapted to the world of, of the prison world that re the recidivism rate just goes into a tailspin and many of them find themselves back in the prison system. So, but what happens if your mind has been incarcerated for 246 years and physically you cannot move freely either? But now that is all changed. You're now out. So what happened? And how did Black Wall Street come to be when the reality is four million three Southern enslaved who were the field workers of the South now are free, but by 1877, they have created a town of their own. And that becomes very important. Only 12 years after 1865, Nicodemus, Kansas became the town, the first town created by the newly freed African-Americans. But also for 1887, this continued, not just in, uh, in Kansas or the Western part of our country, but in Mississippi itself. Mount Bayou in 1877 was the largest black owned town in the United States of America at that time. And Mount Bayou still exists, but not to the point that it does today. And just keep in mind the story of the Benjamin Montgomery family who worked for and worked with Jefferson Davis and his brother Joseph Davis, both of whom were major plantation owners in the South. But the story that is of significance today is that in 1865, at the end of slavery and the 13th Amendment, I, Benjamin Montgomery and his family uh, managed to amass $300,000 and they purchased from Joseph Davis the plantations where they had been enslaved. And also you see the term red bird and there's a little, there's an outside picture on the lower part of black men and women who worked at a bank in Boley, Oklahoma. This is around the 1900s. So around the 1900s, you have about 50 all black towns in the territory. Now, what does this mean about black Wall Street? Because this means that black Wall Street didn't just all of a sudden happen a number of things were happening economically in the mind of the newly freed slaves. And part of that was building their field of dreams. By 1900, you had an incredible number of historical black colleges already in place, even though the first college built was in 1857 in Pennsylvania. But now in Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas, you now have HBCUs that have been put in place in this configuration of working with church groups and other groups who believe in the education of the newly free slaves. So all of this is going on at the same time. They were somehow, after 12 years later, former slaves were staking their claim, making economic dreams of their own. And one of the parts of these would be this, the revival of their economic passion and the creation, if you will, of Tulsa's Black Wall Street. Now, being a history buff as I am, if you have a pen and pencil, I want you to take notes because these are some things that would take us probably a whole day just talking about each one of these separately. The Dow's Allotment Act of 1887 is so important to Black Wall Street because keep in mind, 1832, there were over 5,000 enslaved people on the Trail of Tears. 1865, not only freed the slaves who were held by the white Southerners, but it also freed the slaves that were held by the native nations as well. But in 1887, the land allotments provided land, over three and a half million acres of land were provided to the freedmen who were the blacks, who were descendants of the enslaved and in some instances, the native nation themselves. And the land run of 1887 also included blacks who were coming from all over the country to redefine themselves in the Western part of the United States. But in 1905, something very important happened in Oklahoma territory, the Glenpool Oil Discovery, 
which was the largest oil discovery in the United States, even the world at the time. And Tulsa became known as the oil capital of the world. So this oil discovery did not fall outside of the blacks who owned land as well. So many of the blacks who had gotten land during the land allotment, much of that land also held oil underneath it as well. And of course, one of my favorite part of this is the black visionary. So what I want you to do, know about the, the Dow's allotment, 1887, understand the land run of 1889, the Glenpool oil discovery of 1905. All of these things are very important in the creation of Tulsa's Black Wall Street. It's important to know that African-Americans newly freed, well, not newly now, but freed in 1865, became part of this historical enactment from 1887, 1889 to 1905 and 1907 when Oklahoma became a state. But these are the black visionaries, Edwin P. McKay from New York, born free, and O.W. Gurley from Arkansas. McKay was very important in the founding of Langston, Oklahoma, which exists today, and Langston University in 1894. O.W. Gurley from Arkansas was part of the land run of 1889 in Oklahoma, but he's also being credited as one of the people who purchased land that created the original Black Wall Street physical location. Both of these men had a vision of what could be in the territories. However, by 1907, when Oklahoma became a state, the dreams of a separate Indian state or a separate Black state did no longer exist because now Oklahoma in 1907 became a state within the United States of America, which included the 1803 Louisiana Purchase Land as well. And it's important to know that the reason France needed that land to be sold to the United States for $15 million is because France was in, at that time, in a war with Haiti, a war that the Haitians won. And France was running out of money. And as a result of that, they sold the territory to the United States for $15 million. 1906, Greenwood was platted, and I call it the collection of black gumptioneers. And the reason I created my own word gumptioneers is because entrepreneurialism as a term was not widely used at that time. And entrepreneurship and entrepreneur is a French derivative, and most of the Americans would not be speaking French, but they all knew the word gumption. We've heard that word before. If that man or that boy or that girl has gumption, they can accomplish whatever they want. So that is why I have given the name of the men and women who built Black Wall Street, the gumptioneers of the early 1900s. 1907, as I said, Oklahoma became a state. And this is very important because in the territory, you did not have the onslaught of the Jim Crow laws. But what you had in 1907, the enactment of the Jim Crow laws, which brought about legal segregation, which had not been in existence in the territory to that extent. The Negro Wall Street, Tulsa's Deep Greenwood, by 1910, 1913, it had been given the name, the Negro Wall Street, Greenwood District Prosperous, because it was literally called Deep Greenwood, but a visit by Booker T. Washington in 1913 gave it the name, the Negro Wall Street of America. The accomplishments had been so incredible for these who had been enslaved and the children of those enslaved to have built a field of dreams that was getting wide recognition throughout the United States of America. This just gives you a slight idea of who some of these people were. J.B. Stratford was born a slave, 1861, in the state of Kentucky. But on Black Wall Street, he built one of the most incredible hotels called the Stratford Hotel. And it rivaled any hotel that Blacks owned anywhere in the world, in the United States in particular. That was his field of dreams. Even though born into slavery, he had also become an incredible lawyer 
and entrepreneur as well. And then of course, one of my favorite pictures is that of the Williams family, John and Lulu Williams. And why that is so important to me, if you look down into the lower, I believe would be your lower left-hand corner perhaps, you see the Williams Dreamland Theater. That was a black owned theater that would seat almost a thousand people. And the owner was a lady by the name of Lulu Williams. She was the proprietor, even though the business was owned by she and her husband. But this lady was independent of thought. This is my business. And it was her name that was on the, on the marquee owned by Lulu Williams. This was in 1916, 1917, 1918 fully alive and well in 1921, prior to the 1921 race massacre. And faith was always an important part of many of the newly freed slaves. And so the Mount Zion Baptist Church that they built, former slaves and the children of, in today's money market would be worth around $1.8 million. And then of course you had the Greenwood Booster Club. And these were the men who looked at their place, their field of dreams, and being able to take all of their resources and to create something of their own. And of course, this is a picture of a lady of means who lived on deep Greenwood. Now, this is very important. How did Greenwood become so wealthy? What was it that made it such an incredible place that it had the attention of W.E.W. Du Bois, on the East Coast. People in New York knew about Black Wall Street. People in Boston, Philadelphia, et cetera. They had heard of this story and many had come to see it for themselves. Well, Thursdays on Greenwood was what I call the days of economic exchange. Let's go back to 1905 and the discovery of oil, the Glen Pool discovery. It brought all men and women from literally throughout the United States descended upon the Tulsa area. And they built great oil mansions. And to service those mansions in the what they had built, you had a whole host of African-Americans who were the maids, the butlers, the gardeners, the yard keepers, the nursery keepers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And many of them live in the second homes of these wealthy oil barons. But on Thursdays, all of these people left the south side of Tulsa, which was predominantly white, and came to Deep Greenwood, now known as Black Wall Street, bringing with them all of their earnings. So if you wanted a new hat, you bought it on Black Wall Street. If you wanted a new suit, you bought it on Black Wall Street. If you wanted grocery, you bought it on Black Wall Street. If you wanted to go to the movie, you went to the Williams Theater, called the Dreamland Theater on Black Wall Street. If you had family coming in and wanted to stay at a hotel, you stayed at the hotels that were on Black Wall Street. So all of the monies that were being made was all spent and circulated within this one place. And let's move to the next one and see what happened. You had man's meat market. No matter what you wanted, everything a Black family needed, from hospitals to schools, to churches was on and located in Black Wall Street. You have the Goodwin family, the James Henry Goodwin family from Water Valley, Mississippi. They are now owners of the Black newspaper. They started that, didn't start the newspaper, but James Henry Goodwin worked for the Black newspaper that existed in the early 1900s. And later that family purchased that and renamed it the Oklahoma Eagle. Then you have Dr. A.C. Jackson, who was such an incredible surgeon that the Mayo brothers named him as the top black surgeon, literally in the United States of America. Where was his office? On Black Wall Street. And this is my pride and joy, Simon Berry from Grenada, Mississippi. He owned the only black owned air charter service in the United States of America. He was a philanthropist. He owned hotels on Black Wall Street. And he also gave land to the city of Tulsa to build a park. But the voice of history, the story that I heard came from a survivor by the name of Opal Dargan. 
I met Mrs. Gargan in the 1970s after graduating from Oral Roberts University, where I had attended the last two years of my college degree. And I had become part of the city of Tulsa. And from Oprah Dorgan, who was an incredible educator and a very much of a person involved in Tulsa as a volunteer and was on the advisory board of the Gilcrease Museum where I served as well. But she would often pull me aside to tell me the story of Black Wall Street and tell me what happened in 1921 on May the 30th uh, toward the end of Memorial Day. Because in Tulsa, Memorial Day was being celebrated by the white churches and the black churches separately. But it was also on that day, Memorial Day, when most of the people were off, businesses were closed, that the Drexel building in downtown Tulsa was still open. The elevator lady who, a young girl, under 20 years of age, who ran the elevator, a white lady by the name of Sarah Page. Dick Rowland owned a shoe shine shop in a number of buildings in that area. And according to the story, Dick Rowland was accused of accosting Sarah Page when the Ele Drexel building elevator stopped and there were people waiting to get on the elevator and they just basically said, rape. And that became the headlines in the Tulsa paper at the time. Even though it was later proven, this was totally a fabrication. It had nothing to do with reality, but it became the spark that started the fire that eventually destroyed Black Wall Street. In 48 hours after that pronouncement, Black Wall Street was totally destroyed. All 37 square blocks were burned to the ground as if it never existed. Hundreds of businesses, thousands of black citizens now homeless in less than 48 hours. Beulah Land was a brave. And this is what Oprah Dargan would tell me the story of the fires that destroyed their world and how her mother had hid her under the bed, thinking that their home where it was located was safe, but there were no safe places. All of it was burned. And she remembered as a little girl running with her mother in search of her father, running west and north of where they lived, going into the wooded area, trying to find safety as the only world she had ever known all of her life the ground, the fires and things were so hot, it actually scorched the earth while it was destroying everything that they had built. By June 1st, toward the end of the day, this is what you had. You had the vigilantes, thousands of white citizens who had marched into Tulsa, into Deep Greenwood, Black Wall Street, burned it down. Over 800 people were killed mostly black people. And this was recorded in a book, which I would just take a minute here and read for you. The book had nothing to do with the actual ride itself. This is a story about the Salvation Army. But what people didn't realize that the Salvation Army and the American Red Cross were the two areas that people that were allowed to go into this devastated area to bring some order and to provide volunteer help. And this is what one of the Salvation Army people said. The resurgence of the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, was more than a nuisance. It was deadly. The city of Tulsa, which had heretofore enjoyed racial, some degree of racial tranquility, became the scene of a pitched battle between blacks and whites when a race riot erupted on June 1st, 1921. Before it was ended, over eight hundred blacks and whites were dead and the entire black area of the city burned to the ground. This was from her diary that she had kept and was published in a book called Sweeping Through the Land, The History of the Salvation Army in the Southern United States. You can see the church, Mount Zion, the flames bursting from it, the smoke. This was their pride and joy, the Dreamland Theater, no longer standing totally burned to the ground. And this is the picture that broke my heart. You look at the background, maybe this is where he lived, I would never know. 
And I tried to imagine what could a little brother be saying about his sister or his brother. And all I could think of was the song, the statement, the words, he's not heavy, he's my brother. 246 years of enslavement, 12 years they built Nicodemus, Kansas, which still exists today. By 1921, the wealth of Black Wall Street had caught the attention of the United States and around our country. From Philadelphia to St. Louis, from Boston to places beyond, everyone was hearing about this incredible place that the former slaves and the children of former slaves had built. And now it didn't exist anymore. It was completely and totally burned to the ground. In search of a home, it was one of the few places in our country where bomb-like material was dropped that kept the fires going, that basically continued the devastation that was being done by hand. They say that the trains were so filled that people were leaning out of the windows. Thousands left Tulsa and never returned. Where did they go? They went to Chicago, they went to New York, they went to Philadelphia, they went to California, they went to Kansas. But there was another point that was very interesting. The black soldiers who had, who had fought in World War I, that was one of the first times that many of these black men had been treated as full-fledged human beings because the French did not care about the color of their skin. They were soldiers working side by side. So many of these blacks took their families and went back to Paris and never returned to the United States where many of their descendants still live today. The voice of history rising from the ashes. They were crushed, there's no doubt about it, but they survived. Volunteers came from throughout the country, black volunteers from the YWCA, the YMCA, the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, uh, and a gentleman by the name of Maurice Willis, who's a Canadian who ran the American Red Cross. They worked diligently to restore as much as they could of what had been destroyed, turning schools into hospitals, building makeshift homes, working together to create something. And even though they were emotionally crushed and physically had lost all that they had, by 1926, they had come alive. By 1926, Black Wall Street was striving again. Distinguished Black guests would come to Tulsa to see it for themselves. George Washington Carver, as well as W.E.W. Du Bois, the great Black historian, would come to the city of Tulsa. Yes, Black Wall Street, Tulsa's Black story, that's our shared story. And the history is not just for African-Americans. This is all of our history. This is who we are. This is, this is the nation maturing toward becoming that perfect union. Abraham Lincoln probably said it best in 1863 when he delivered his now famous Gettysburg Address. He said, you know, can that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated long endure? He spoke to the fragility of democracy. He spoke to what was needed in order to keep it alive. We must know the stories that we share and we must share the stories that we know. Embracing our history, the known and unknown. These are history elements that I had no idea about because these are things that none of us were taught. September of 2020, the Smithsonian finally rebuffed the story that had happened in 1918, the story of the incredible kingdom of Kush that had been discovered by the Egypt Egyptologist Henry George Regina in 1918. But Mr. Regina has said, there is no way that anyone of Negroid heritage could have built such an incredible place. And many people took him at his word, but it wasn't true at all. The kingdom of Kush was built by people who looked like me and many of you. 
in the National Geographic in 2008, told the stories of the black pharaohs that ruled all of Upper and Lower Egypt. And they told, and the story was also told, which I had never heard before in the 14th century, we were introduced to the life of Mansa Musa of the Malayan Empire, who has been defined within the last year as one of the wealthiest figures, historical figures that ever lived. His wealth was valued at anywhere from 400 to $415 billion today. So I, it's important to understand not only what happened in 1619, but also to know what happened in the 14th century. To be able to go to Isaiah in the Bible, the 37th chapter in the ninth verse, and read about Jehakra. He was one of the 25th dynasty of black kings that ruled upper and lower Egypt. These things were never taught. These things were never told. But history is a great teacher. But the thing that we have to do is go to class. So what is happening 100 years later? Now, every day in Tulsa for the last year, they have been trying to find the dead who have been, no one knows exactly where all the dead were placed, where their graves are. So important people with historical and academic backgrounds in these types of searches are now searching places in Tulsa to find the dead that the numbers have not been accurately recorded. Only the number 300 was in the newspaper, but the diary from the Salvation Army gives a number of 800. So no one really knows how many people were killed or how many people lost their lives. But one of the things that is going on, the world will never forget that a place once existed that was called Tulsa's Black Wall Street. The museum will open probably in June of this year. And it will tell the story from start to finish of who these people were, where they came from, and the legacy that they left. It has been my pleasure being with you today, sharing with you an incredible American saga, the story of the free and enslaved people who became the proprietors, the businessmen and women, the great medical team, the educators, the doctors, the lawyers, who built what was known in 1921 as Tulsa's Black Wall Street. Wow, thank you, Mr. Talbert. What an incredible, incredible lesson for us all. Thank you for taking us to class. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question um, is, when they rebuilt Black Wall Street, was it many of the same businesses or new ones? And did it ever get close to being what it was before? To answer that question, it never was close to what it was before. I mean, it was, it was very nice, comparatively speaking, that everything had been lost and they had the willpower to rebuild. But it was never like that first building. That first building was their imagination on steroids. I mean, they just knocked it out of the ballpark an incredible place. And that was one other part of the question, Dr. Barnes, that you asked. If you could repeat that for a second, make sure. Um, it was, uh, did it ever get close to being what it was before? I think you answered that. Right. It did not. We have a second question here. Are there any known connections between Natchez and businessmen and women of the thriving Tulsa community in the late 1800s and early 1900s? Well, there was a black doctor in Natchez that was a friend to, I would think of her name. Um, she was the first black female millionaire in our country. And she was from New Orleans and she owned a beauty school and made hair products for black Walker. women. Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker. That was a connection between Madam C.J. Walker and Tulsa's Black Wall Street and Natchez, Mississippi. Very interesting. Do you have any questions in your end, Emily? I don't see any more. I'm sorry, I couldn't get unmuted. Um, yes, we've had, let's see, we've had a couple more come through. What is the Greenwood District like present day? Good question. Uh, it has certainly, it's in a revival mode. 
but it is reviving in that businesses are locating there, but it is not a segregated world anymore. So it is not being built as the historical Black Wall Street, uh, but the Monica still exists today. Many of the businesses that exist there, for example, there's a coffee shop called Liquid Lounge on Black Wall Street. There are bookstores there, et cetera. But the totality of haberdasheries, of women hat shops, of medical facilities, those things that would take care of the neighborhood, those things are not there. Mostly eating establishment, there's a baseball field there, a number of things like that recently built uh, in, in Tulsa in that area. It is being revived. It is certainly not a place of death, but a place of life but it is not being revived in total by African-Americans. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Did you see them? Oh, did the leaders of Oklahoma actually, uh, what, what did it say? Put a train station instead of helping them rebuild? Did they put a train station? Yeah. That's interesting because... After the arrest of Dick Rowland and after the total destruction of Black Wall Street, there was another conversation. Tulsa was a railroad hub and part of the land that many of the other visionaries wanted that land to be utilized to expand the railroad system. But a black lawyer by the name of B.C. Franklin took their case to court to make sure that eminent domain could not get their land and he won. Uh, so the land that was at that time that was owned by the black, they kept their land. But there was the idea that they would move the blacks further north and their land would become part of the railroad system, which did not happen at that particular time. Okay, and one more. Can writers write freely a black, about Black Wall Street, specifically like a play script, or would they have to get permission and rights to do so? A hundred years, history becomes in the open space. But once you, you know, I think it probably would be fair and right to look at those people who are still, dis who are descendants of those. And uh, because so much of it's in the public domain now that would not have been in the early part of the 1920s, but it's in the public domain now. And people are writing stories about Black Wall Street all over the country. People are doing plays and things like that. So, but I would say once the museum is up, that would be a good place to call and to find out exactly what is required. But when you look at all of the information that is being done from a visual perspective, my gut feeling tells me that much of Black Wall Street and what happened there historically is in the public domain. Same as the uh, Titanic, uh, the movie The Titanic and what happened there the time in which it happened, those things over time become part of the public domain. Gotcha. Well, that was, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed taking your class today. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate you being here with us, Mr. Talbert, and all that you've done to support the NLCC over the years. I know you have presented for us and supported us for, for quite some time, and we really appreciate you. Um, Dr. Barnes, I appreciate you being here today as well and handling our questions and introduction. And I think that's it. I do want to remind everybody and thank you for tuning in and remind everyone that we have three more days of presentations coming. Um, there is a survey available. There'll be one in the comments and you'll be able to find it in many places. I would love your feedback. Please let me know how we're doing. Um, and I just want to thank everybody again and hope you all have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. You guys take care of yourselves. Thank you.